Voila. So welcome, Falsha, to everyone. And a special welcome to author Nula O'Connor for joining us here at the Princess Grace Irish Library in Monaco. This is her final event in a month-long itinerary as recipient of the award from Dublin City Council and Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. Published by New Island Books, Nora is a bio-fictional novel and was named as the One Dublin, One Book choice for 2022. The New York Times named it one of the best books of historical fiction. So we are honoured to be the only venue outside of Ireland to host Nula. So on behalf of myself and the trustees of the library, our warm welcome and thanks to Nula for tonight. Also, thank you for, to Pierre for joining us. Pierre Joannin is the Honorary Consul of Ireland for the South of France and a former trustee of the library. And our gratitude to Virginia Disney Connell, Artistic Director of the Monaco Ireland Arts uh, Society, for all the preparation work behind tonight's performance by actors Des Burke, Frank Duboussillon, and Andrew Riley. So a brief word on Nula's biography. Nula is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, and poet. She grew up in Ireland and lives in Galway, uh, hometown to Nora Barnacle. Nula is the author of four previous novels and six short story collections. She has won many prizes for her short fiction, including the Francis McManus Award, the James Joyce Quarterly Fiction Contest, and the UK's Short Fiction Journal Prize. Her work has also been nominated for numerous other prizes, including the International Dublin Literary Award. She is editor-in-chief at Flash e Splunk. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> you can ask about that later. So Nula has also curated this year's exhibition, which is currently on at the Museum of Literature Ireland, Molly, in Dublin, entitled Love Says Bloom which looks at the deep love between James Joyce, Nora, and their children, Giorgio and Lucia, using music as a steadfast element in their lives. So I'm just going to read Molly's review of Nora, one of many glowing reviews for your book. So in sensuous resonant prose, Nula O'Connor has conjured the definitive portrait of this strong, passionate, and loyal Irish woman. Nora is a tour de force, an earthy and authentic love letter to Irish literature's greatest muse. So, which brings me to the love letters that Joyce wrote to Nora, four of which will be read by the actors tonight. And while ma many consider the language a bit risque and shocking and might have us blushing tonight, it is pure Joyce, full of life and lust, and who are we to censor him in the 21st century? As Joyce said, responding to criticism of Ulysses when it was first published, if Ulysses isn't worth reading, then life isn't worth living. And this morning, actually, Nula gave a wonderful talk to the uh, students of the International School of Monaco. And one of the 16-year-olds asked her what Joyce might think of how open we are nowadays with our thoughts, we're so open about life. So I think they are bemused by the battle that Joyce had to get published. So thank you, Nula, for your beautifully written book and for remaining open and true to Nora. So over to you. Enjoy the evening. Thanks, Amelia. <clears throat> So I don't really know how much you know about Nora and Joyce's journey, so I think I'll just take you through it as such. Um, and I'm going to divide the talk into four pieces, which is essentially the main places they lived. And interspersed with that, we'll hear some of the very upfront, very erotic letters that, the, that Joyce sent to Nora in 1909 when they were separated. So Nora... Joseph Barnacle was born in 1884 on the 21st of March in the Galway workhouse. It's not that her family were very poor. The workhouse was a place where you had babies if you didn't have them at home. So Mrs. Barnacle, her mother, Annie, who was a dressmaker, decided to go for this baby, her second baby, her second of eight, to the workhouse uh, maternity wing. She was married to Thomas Barnacle, who was a baker. Joyce would later comment about Thomas Barnacle's downfall. Papa drank all the loaves and buns like a man. 
<laughs> I always wonder about that like a man. What does he exactly mean by it? I think it can be interpreted a few different ways. So Nora, until she was five, lived with her parents and then she was fostered out to her grandmother. Um, and that was a very normal practice in Ireland. Even when I was a child, a lot of my friends would have lived with their grannies. It was a very normal thing for one child out of a large family or a few to be given to a relative. Um, Mrs. Barnacle wasn't well. I think she just had twins. And so she was overwhelmed with other babies. And Nora was sent to live with Granny Healy, a few steps away, essentially, in Whitehall in Galway City. Um, Nora lived there with Granny Healy and Uncle Tommy, who was a handyman. And her other son, Michael, lived close by. And he was a customs officer, so he, had, he did well. He would later become a very good friend of Joyce's. He was very good to them. So Nora went to the local primary school and then she went to, um, when she was 12, she left school, which again in Ireland was very normal until about 1967 when education became free for everybody. So up until that point, most children left school at the age of 12 um, and they went to work and Nora was no different. She got a job with the presentation nuns. There was a bit of pull used. Her mother knew the abbess and she got Nora in and she worked there firstly we think as a laundress because that's on the census and later as a porteress so Nora's manners were good enough for her to be allowed to answer the door for the nuns essentially it was a silent order so Nora would let visitors in um, she worked there for seven years and she had she stayed living with her uncle. Her grandmother died in 1897. It was a terrible year for Nora, essentially. Her grandmother died. Her parents separated. It's possible Mrs. Barnacle was waiting for her mother to die in order to leave Thomas Barnacle because he was a drinker. Um, and one of Nora's boyfriends that we know of died that year as well. Um, and she left primary school and went to work. So a big year in 1897 for the 12 to 13 year old Nora Barnacle. Seven years she works in the presentation convent with the nuns and then one time she's walking out with a Protestant boy called Willie Mulvey and Uncle Tommy does not like this. They're a Catholic family. She should not be walking out with a Protestant boy and Uncle Tommy beats her. Um, beats her with a stick and Nora is obviously hurt and incensed and she runs away from home. So she leaves Galway, she's 19 years of age and she goes to Dublin. To her advantage, she has seven years work experience under her belt. And so she very quickly gets a job. She goes to an agency, gets a job at Finn's Hotel in Dublin, which is very central. If you know Dublin at all, Trinity College is back onto Nassau Street and Finn's Hotel essentially looks over into Trinity College to the grounds there. So that's where Nora's working. She's a maid of all work, a chambermaid, she works in the bar, she waits tables, you do everything when you work in a small family hotel like Vin's. And to all intents and purposes, she's good at her job, but she's not a saver. Uh, she's not someone who can budget well with money. And who walks into her life but another man who is not good with money, and that's James Joyce. So in 1904, on the 10th of June, James Joyce spots a young lady on Nassau Street and decides he likes the look of her very much and he approaches her. It's the 10th of June and he says, might we walk out together? And they agree to go out on the 14th of June. But Nora doesn't show up and Joyce is upset and he does what he does best. He texts, puts pen to paper and this is what he writes to her. It's a very James Joyce letter, as you'll see. I may be blind. I looked for a long time at a head of reddish brown hair and decided it was not yours. I went home quite dejected. I would like to make an appointment, but it might not suit you. I hope you'll be kind enough to make one with me if you have not forgotten me. So that's the entirety of the note he sends to her on the 15th of June. And clearly Nora says yes, because the next day, the 16th of June, they have their first walking out together and they go to Ring's End and they have an intimate moment and this sets in chain the relationship that will last until Joyce's death. They meet each other as equally confident people for different reasons. They're also both quite sensuous people 
So she arrives to him fully formed as a sensual young woman. She's had three boyfriends that we know of and that Jim will very soon know about because James Joyce was great at picking stories out of people and then repurposing them for his own devices and doing it beautifully, obviously. So we know that Greta in the short story, The Dead, is based on Nora and Greta's memory of the young man that died for her is one of the young boyfriends because two of Nora's boyfriends died. Um, the young man in that is sort of an amalgam of two of the Michaels that died. I was going to say on Nora. They didn't die on Nora. Who died? <laughs> um, and we also know that Bertha in his play Exiles is based on Nora. There's a Joyce tried to set Nora up to have an affair with a friend of theirs in Trieste. And that play is kind of based on that. And we also know that Molly Bloom is an amalgam character. So she's partly Nora and she's partly a few other women that Joyce knew. Joyce talked about being a scissors and paste man. And I think what he meant by that was he did mine people's minds, stories, information and all of the stuff he knew and all of the stuff he found in newspapers and in literature in general, he used to his own devices. And anyone who's read Ulysses knows that, that there is a lot in it that's based on history and, you know, different stories that he used from Irish literature and other literatures. And obviously it's also loosely based on the Odyssey. So after four or five months together, Joyce disdains the Catholic Church. He disdains the repression in Ireland because of the collusion of church and state. And he, uh, he tells Nora he's going away. He's not staying in Ireland. He doesn't want to. He's already tasted Europe. He's gone to college in Paris for a little while, is not successful there. But when she meets him, he's unemployed. He's staying in friends' houses. She's employed and has a place to stay, her hotel. She has accommodation there. So she's better set up for life than he is. He's, a, he's drifting very much. But what he does know is he's not going to stay in Ireland to be repressed the way he saw his mother being repressed by his father and by the church. So he says to her, do you understand me and will you come away with me? And she said yes. And he said, before we go, I need to tell you we won't be getting married and I want you to know my past history. And so he tells her essentially that he has been I don't know if attending is the right word but going to prostitutes since he was in his teens so he's already sexually experienced and she isn't you know and we know this because he talks about her corset he calls it the breastplate and how he can't get past the breastplate and you know always trying to get her to do things that she doesn't want to do because she's a good Irish Catholic girl but they are both sensuous and they're not afraid of their sensuality, which I think we have um, a vision of Ireland as holy Catholic that is true in one sense, but also Irish people tend to have a good old pagan heart and they do what they want. It doesn't matter what the church is telling them to do. And Nora was very much of that ilk. But she really compromised herself by going abroad with this man unmarried knowing that they would be entering into essentially a marital relationship. And they did pretend they were married when they were in Trieste. Um, so off they go. They leave Ireland together on the 8th of October 1904. And by a circuitous route, they end up in Trieste. So they start in Zurich for a few nights. There's no job in Zurich. He'd been promised a job teaching English in the Berlitz school. The job's not there. Uh, they end up in Pola which is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that time. It's now in Croatia. And they end up landing in Trieste, which is now part of Italy and then was Austro-Hungary. He gets a job in the Berlitz school. She stays at home. And their baby, Giorgio, the first one, is born the following July, 1905. And essentially, they end up in the very situation they sought to escape. They're in a conventional relationship he's conventionally going out to earn the money and she's conventionally <laughs> staying at home and trying to stop him from going out drinking, which would be a very conventional Irish marriage. <laughs> um, she is a very earthy, big-hearted, naturally cheerful, charismatic woman. He, by contrast, is a sensitive, nervy, tender individual, an intellect, a genius, as we know now. Um, so they are very much in contrast to one another. He's educated, she's not. But they 
are a very good union, a very solid union, and there is huge love between them. And that love then is passed on to the children. A year later, they have another child, Lucia, a daughter, and their family is then complete. She had one more pregnancy that she lost, which she was not upset about, but he was. So in contrast to her mother and what would have been expected of her, she does not have six, seven, eight, nine children like her own mother and like Joyce's mother. They have a small family and they live in Europe. A strange migration at that time for Irish people. Most Irish people went to the United States, Canada or the UK essentially. So they're an unusual pair from the start. Um, they briefly parted in 1909 when Joyce, who was a great man for schemes, he had schemes to sell Irish tweed in Trieste, he had schemes to sell skyrockets, and then his big scheme was to set up the first dedicated cinema in Ireland. Uh, his sister gave him the idea. And in 1909, he goes back to Ireland with money from backers and several of these Italian backers, and they set up the Volta Cinema on Mary Street, the first cinema in Ireland. And during that time, Joyce hears a whisper that Nora had been unfaithful to him before they left Ireland, and he's devastated. They're a very, very committed and loving couple, and he is absolutely devastated at the idea that she let a friend of his touch her or do anything to her or even be with her or kiss her. And he starts to write back accusatory letters to Nora back in Trieste, innocent of all of these charges. And the letters are appalling. A friend of his, F. John F. Byrne, tells him there's no truth in this rumour. Those others are just trying to annoy you. Don't be believing it. Take Nora's word. She, this has never happened. She never had any sort of relationship with this chap. Um, and Joyce believes Byrne because Byrne is a steady guy, a good guy, and calms down. And from, from that calming down bursts forth his amazing love for Nora. And he begins to write these extraordinary, upfront, sensual, erotic letters. And we're going to hear from one of them now. Dublin, 7th of September 1909. Only silence from you, dear. Though I suppose you thought we would be at sea by now. We leave tomorrow, Eva, Giorgio and I. Please read all of my letters again, and please don't quarrel with me any more, Nora. Only you can keep my love aflame. I wish I was asleep in your arms now. I have been wretched in Dublin. Will you mind me well when I am back? Are the right parts of you plumping out, Nora? Do you drink the cocoa I sent? I giggle to myself to think of your girlish breasts. How ridiculous you are, dear. Your son is four and you're a grown woman. You must begin to act like that now. You cannot remain the curious girl from Galway forever. And yet, my heart softens to think of that slender body of yours. The small shoulders. <laughs> you're a rogue. Did you snip the hair below to remain a girl? I want you to wear black drawers for me. I want you to learn how to please me, to make me deserve you. I know you will, and that we will be happy. Don't cry, Nora, when we reunite. I want your eyes to glow. Take me in your arms. Feel tenderness for me, and lead me right. Look well for me, dear. Have your hair clean and free from ashes. It's not right to look slovenly at 25 young years. Have something warm to eat ready for us, won't you? Let me feel happy from the moment I arrive there. I shall want a good cup of coffee in a nice little cup. Have a salad for me. Don't let onions or gargle into the house. And Nora... Don't, on your first words to me, mention money or debt, please. I cannot wait to see Trieste, our beloved shelter again. And from the train, the white glow of the castle at Mary. Good night for now, my gossip. 
I have written to you much. I am bringing a present for you. I'm not so bad. Jim. <laughs> That's a, a lovely, reasonable one. <laughs> he, he gives out to her and tells her, don't have ashes in your hair and don't have garlic and onions in the house and all that, but there isn't too much madness in that one. So Trieste really was the place that formed them. That's where they became the loving couple, the loving parents, the parents indeed. They brought over in the great Irish emigrant tradition three of Jim's uh, siblings his brother Stanny, who was really his sounding board and friend in the family, and two of his sisters, Eva and Eileen. Eva did not settle, she didn't like it. Eileen did settle and she married uh, a man called Szarek. I think he was Czechoslovakian. I had a whole scene in the book. Poor Frank, as they called him, um, committed suicide. And I had that scene in the book where that terrible event happened and Jim very unhelpfully sent Stanny to tell the sister what had happened, didn't tell her himself, even though he had the opportunity. Um, but my editor cut it out. And this is what happens when you're writing a novel like this. You try to put everything in because it's all so important in the story. And then your editor says, OK, that doesn't move things along. Let's take them out. Uh, and I found my editor was very concerned with um, Jim being present a lot, you know, I had a lot of scenes where Nora had her own agency and autonomy and was on her own with the children or whatever. Um, but a lot of those scenes got cut. So they're in Trieste and they're happy. They have family around them. Stanny is there certainly contributing to the coffers, which is really the reason he was brought over, because Jim was, if you know anything about James Joyce, you know that he was great at spending other people's money. Um, and managed to have a lot of sponsors in his time. People did love him and loved his writing and loved the whole project of Joyce and were willing to give him money. In fact, uh, the UK editor and um, heiress, Harriet Weaver, gifted him the equivalent of 1.5 million euro in the course of her gifting to the family. And she gave that money to enable Joyce to write, to pay his bills and write because um, he stopped teaching English as soon as he could, as soon as he got some sponsorship. So they're there, and unfortunately, after a few years, and really their golden years were in Trieste, they're happy um, finding themselves as people and as parents. And, and Jim as a writer, though, he had a lot of disappointment with the publishing world. His books were not published easily, any of them. World War I breaks out, and they can't stay in Trieste because foreign nationals are no longer welcome. And Zurich gives them shelter, Switzerland. So off they go from the jewel of the Adriatic, which is Trieste, this bright, sunny, beautiful place, a lot like what I see of Monaco, very white, bright, light, beautiful sea. And they go to Zurich. And if you've been to Zurich, you know that it has a sort of an atmosphere because of the mountains around it. And, you know, it's just, it's a totally different feeling and they come here with their children it, Italian is the language of their house they speak Italian at home in fact the Joyce children never had brilliant idiomatic children or English rather even as adults and they go to Zurich and they're living in mud floor flats and mice infested flats and it's it's a difficult time uh, Joyce is still teaching English but mostly privately to private students so they're really not doing very well financially. Michael Healy, who I mentioned earlier, Nora's uncle, sends them money. That in the first part of the first winter in Zurich, and Nora used the money to buy flannels for the children to keep them warm. They found it extremely cold in Zurich. Um, but Joyce, ever the uh, innovator, he's at this point writing Ulysses. He's also setting up a an acting troupe called the English Players with a guy called Claude Sykes, an Englishman. And Nora becomes friendly with Mrs. Sykes. In the way of Irish people, the Joyce's never used people's first names. So Sylvia Beach was never Sylvia Beach to them. She was Miss Beach. And Miss Weaver was Miss Weaver. And even the Sykes's who were their best friends at that time are Mr. and Mrs. Sykes. It's a very... I remember it from my own childhood. My mother's best friend who lived a few doors down was Mrs. Hewitt. They were the same age, all of that. But there was a sort of a formality about that. 
Um, so they're in Zurich. Joyce sets up the players. They put on a sing play, Riders to the Sea, and Nora plays Kathleen, and she coaches the rest of the cast with their Galway accents. So and the children played in a crowd scene. So it's a family affair. The social life is much better in Zurich, especially from Nora's point of view, because a lot of the people living there are expat. They're English speaking people. So and it's OK to go out in the evening with your wife, whereas in Trieste, Joyce would drink alone. Nora didn't drink much, but she certainly wouldn't mind going out for a while. <laughs> the children are a little older and they leave them at home alone, which anyone who grew up in Ireland and is around my age or older will know was a very normal practice for people to leave their children at home alone. <laughs> um, so off they'd go and they put on these plays and they had a good enough time. You know, Stanny, meanwhile, Joyce's brother, is incarcerated in Katzenau for siding with the irredentists in the, um, you know, during the wartime. So Nora is sending Stanny care packages of cigarettes to Sal. He doesn't smoke and chocolate and tea and cocoa and all this sort of stuff. And the letters between Nora and Stanny are kind of flirty, you know, so I warmed that up a bit in my novel and gave them a little a little tender moment as well. <laughs> Not as tender as Joyce's moments with Nora. Um, so the war comes to an end and they have to decide what they're going to do. And they decide to go back to Trieste. Um, and they're not long in Trieste when Joyce has itchy feet. So we'll go back to the actors and we'll read the next letter. Dublin, December the 13th, 1909. Do you believe in my love at last, dearest? Oh, do, Nora. Why, everyone who has ever seen me can read it in my eyes when I speak of you. As your mother says, they light up like candles in my head. The time will fly now, my darling, until your loving tender arms encircle me. I will never leave you again. Not only do I want your body, as you know, but I want also your company. My darling, I suppose that compared with your splendid, generous love for me, my love for you looks very poor and threadbare. But it is the best I can give you, my own dear sweetheart. Take it, my love. Save me and shelter me. I am your child, as I told you, and you must be severe with me, my little mother. Punish me as much as you like. I would be delighted to feel my flesh tingling under your hand. Do you know what I mean, Nora, dear? I wish you would smack me or flog me even, not in play, dear, in earnest and on my naked flesh. I wish. You were strong, strong, dear, and had a big, full, proud bosom and big, fat thighs. I would love to be whipped by you, Nora, love. I would love to have done something to displease you, something trivial, even perhaps one of my rather dirty habits that make you laugh, and then to hear you call me into your room, and then to find you sitting in an armchair, with your fat thighs far apart and your face deep red with anger and a cane in your hand to see you point to what I had done and then with a movement of rage pull me towards you and throw me face downwards across your lap then to feel your hands tearing down my trousers <coughs> and inside clothes and turning up my shirt to be struggling in your strong arms and in your lap to feel you bending down like an angry nurse whipping a child's bottom until your big full bubbies almost touch me and to feel you flog 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 me viciously on my naked and quivering flesh pardon me dear if this is silly, I began this letter so quietly, and yet I must end it in my own mad fashion. Are you offended by my horrible, shameless writing, dear? 
I expect some of the filthy things I wrote made you blush. Are you offended because I said I lo love to look at the brown stain that comes behind your girlish white trousers? I suppose you think me a filthy wretch. How will you answer these letters? I hope and hope you too will write me letters even madder and dirtier than mine to you. You can if you only wish to, Nora. Perhaps tomorrow you will write again. Good night, dearest. Jim. So Nora did indeed write letters to Jim and they pleased him. But unfortunately, those letters are missing. So for the purposes of my novel, I had to make them up using his as a call and response guide. So where he praised her for using certain phrases, I then wrote them into my letters. So that was a fun part of writing the book. <laughs> um, so. Yes, they got back to Trieste. They had had a side trip to Rome in the middle of all this in 1906, 1907, and both of them didn't like Rome. Uh, Joyce was working in a bank. He wanted something different than teaching English, but the bank was long hours and he found it very boring, so he very soon tired of that, and they left Rome, went back to Trieste. Um, but when they came back from World War I into, Z into Trieste from Zurich, they... They just couldn't settle. They still had friends there. They still had Stanny there. Eileen was there too, but they couldn't settle. So they left. Ezra Pound, actually, the American writer, was looking for writers for Harriet Weaver's magazine. And he said to Weaver, have you heard of Joyce? You should publish Joyce. And then he started saying to Joyce, all of the writers are in Paris. You need to go to Paris. And Joyce was a great man for moving about, probably learned in his childhood from his father, who was constantly uprooting the family in the middle of the night to run away from bailiffs and landlords because he didn't pay them. He was really not a great individual in terms of minding his family and providing for them. So Joyce followed this pattern of having shallow roots. His biographer, Elman, said Joyce throve on flurry. And his brother, Stanny, said Jim lives on the excitement of events. And so when... Life didn't hand him flurry and exciting events. He created them. And he did this by moving house constantly, moving country often, um, by having dalliances with women. He really fancied one of his students in Trieste, Amalia Popper, and he approached her and sent her letters. Her father chased him away. <laughs> um, there was a woman called Marth Fleischmann in Zurich who lived behind them, and Joyce would watch her through the window and then sent letters to her, arranged a meeting with her. Um, just mad stuff altogether. <laughs> with the collusion of his friend Frank Budgeon, which was a bit nasty to Nora, because Frank was also Nora's friend. And Nora had confided in Frank that she said, he wants me to go with other men. So Joyce had asked Nora to go with other men, and she refused to because she didn't want to. So Joyce created flurry and excitement. So. The next big excitement for the family was Paris. They arrived in Paris in 1920. They lived in a borrowed flat. Um, there was a party for them very early on, given by the French poet Valérie Larbeau. They were staying in his apartment just temporarily. They were supposed to go to Paris for a couple of weeks and ended up there for nearly 20 years. Um, at the party, Sylvia Beach, who had been reading Joyce, because at this stage, his poetry, Chamber Music, had been published. Portrait of the Artist had been published, at least in serial form at that point. No, it had been published in book form. And she had been reading him and she really admired his writing. And she approached him at the party and said, is this the great Joyce? And he stuck out his hand and said, James Joyce. He was very soft-spoken. Apparently he had a limp handshake. And next thing, a dog barked somewhere and he, he said... Oh, is that dog here? Is it fierce? He was terrified of dogs. He was afraid of thunder. He didn't like loud noises. He was a very quiet, introverted, low-key person. He drank alcohol to make him more gregarious and to sort of be able to socialize with people. Um, but despite that strange initial first impression for Sylvia Beach, she adored Joyce. 
And when it came, so Ulysses was being serialized in the United States, and then the serialization was halted because of an obscenity trial, the nausea episode where Gertie flashes her knickers and Bloom does something else, became scandalous, and they stopped publishing it in serial form, and they refused to publish it in book form. It was not allowed to be published in book form. Uh, Heap and Anderson, who had been publishing it in serial form, nearly ended up in prison, but were bailed out by uh, a woman called Mrs. Fortune, who stumped up the hundred dollars to stop them going to jail. Um, so Joyce was in Shakespeare and Co., Sylvia Beach's bookshop, her English language bookshop, which Kevin Birmingham has described as a thinly monetized social center. So essentially Shakespeare and Co., though it was a bookshop, it operated like a library, like a postre stand. It was where the writers went to hang around and meet each other and Sylvia allowed them to receive their post there and she gave them books. If they brought them back clean, they could borrow the books. So she was hardly making any money, but she loved Joyce and He's in there anyway, mithering on about nobody will publish my book now and what am I going to do? And Sylvia said, would you do me the honour of letting me publish Ulysses? And of course he bit her hand off. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, her life partner, Adrienne Monnier, had a shop across the road. Um, and she, a French language shop, and she was publishing books. And so Sylvia had a model for this, you know, how to do this. Uh, Paula here at the library was showing me her Joyce collection today, the library's Joyce collection. And there are handwritten letters from Adrienne Monnier in the collection here. It's astonishing. And there's just, there's a first edition of Ulysses. If you get a chance to look at that, please do. It's, you know, Beach decided she's going to publish this book. And what she does is she publishes a special edition. It's a thousand copies. This thing is three and a half pounds in weight. It's 726 pages. It's an astonishing undertaking. And it can only be bought by wealthy people because it's a subscription, because they know they're going to run into trouble. As it is, if you want to read a brilliant account of it being smuggled down people's trousers across the border into Canada, one by one, because it's so big, um, and the obscenity trial and all of that stuff, Kevin Birmingham's book is highly recommended. It's called, I think, Kevin's book is called The Most Dangerous Book, uh, and it has a subtitle like The Fight to Get Ulysses Published. It didn't come out in the UK until 1937. So if you think 1922, it comes out in Paris. It takes 15 years or so to come out in England. It's never published in Ireland until much later. It's not banned in Ireland, it just can't be got, <laughs> you know, unless somebody has managed to smuggle it in somehow. And then it doesn't come out in the States until, I can't remember what year, but it's it's later. It comes out in French in 1929. And again, there's a beautiful uh, copy of the French edition here. And Adrienne Monnier's shop publishes that. So here comes fame with Ulysses. Here comes money. Harriet Weaver is now sponsoring the family. But also here comes trouble for the Joyces. Because very soon after this, so there you've... We've come into 1920s Paris. It's, you know, Bohemia. It's, you know, the flapper era. It's the lost generation in Paris. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Zelda Fitzgerald, all of these wonderful people, Gertrude Stein. But Joyce and Nora are heading into their 40s. And they're quite genteel and middle class in their, um, in their beliefs, in their, their, their way of acting despite the fact that they're not married to each other, that doesn't matter. They act like married people. And But Giorgio and Lucia are in their late teens and they're entering this world of women's skirts getting shorter, uh, free and easy, loving people talking about their bodies in ways that aren't talked about in genteel society. So even though Joyce is an avant-garde modernist writer, writing extraordinary private letters to his wife, an extraordinary fiction, in real life he doesn't like if people swear in front of him. He's extremely polite and, um, you know, he's like, a, he's gentlemanly. He's generous. He always talks to porters and waiters. He actually prefers so-called ordinary people to the literati who are hounding him. Because with fame, 
There are people knocking on their door. There are people sending wine over when they dine in Fouquet's. There are people sending notes over. Can we meet the great James Joyce? And he hates all of this. He's he's not that kind of person. He's introverted. He's back. He just wants to be with his family or writing. So he finds fame difficult. Um, and then Lucia and Giorgio are entering into this world, as we say, of the Bohemia. And then Lucia is diagnosed as a hebephrenic schizophrenic. And she has many issues that go with that or that seem to just glom onto that. So she she's promiscuous. She goes missing for days at a time. She has catatonic episodes. She is violent, especially towards Nora, who's her main caregiver, because Jim is either drinking in the bistros with his new writer friends or he's writing. And Nora facilitates his writing. She's a brilliant person for dragging him home from the bistros and telling him he's had enough and for making sure he gets to write. But Lucia's diagnosis is a huge um, blow to the family because Jim fairly firmly believes Lucia is merely artistic and, you know, <coughs> what what is the word I'm looking for? You know, a wonderful, unusual eccentric sort of human being but Nora and others can see she's actually ill and she's brought to many different doctors over the course of them trying to find essentially a cure for her which can't be found because she's ill. So I'll pause there because we're going to have another letter from the Joyce Oop. <laughs> Dublin, December 3rd, 1909. My darling little convent girl, there is some star too near the earth, for I am still in a fever fit of animal desire. Today I stopped short, often in the street, with an exclamation whenever I thought of the letters I wrote to you last night mm. and the night before. They must read awful in the cold light of day. Perhaps their coarseness has disgusted you. I know you are of a much finer nature than your extraordinary lover, and though it was you yourself, you hot little girl, who first wrote to me, saying that you were longing to be fucked by me, yet I suppose the wild filth and obscenity of my reply went beyond all bounds of modesty. When I got your express letter this morning, and saw how careful you are of your worthless gin, I felt ashamed of what I had written. Yet now, night, secret sinful night has come down again on the world and I'm alone again, writing to you and your letters again folded before me on the table. Do not ask me to go to bed, dear. Let me write to you, dear. <clears throat> As you know, dearest, I never use obscene phrases in speaking. You have never heard me, have you? utter an unfit word before others. When men tell in my presence here filthy or lecherous stories, I hardly smile. Yet you seem to turn me into a beast. It was you yourself, you naughty, shameless girl, who first led the way. Nora, dear, I'm dying all day to ask you a question. I know that I was the first man that blocked you, but did any man ever frig you? Did that boy you were fond of ever do it? Tell me now, Nora, truth for truth, honesty for honesty. When you were with him in the dark at night, did your fingers never, never unbutton his trousers and slip inside like mice? Did you ever frig him, dear? Tell me truly, or anyone else. Did you never... Never feel a man's or a boy's prick in your fingers until you unbutton me. If you're not offended, do not be afraid to tell me the truth. Darling, darling, tonight I have such a wild lust for your body that if you were here beside me, and even if you told me with your own lips that half the red-headed louse of Galway had had a fuck at you before me, I'd still rush at you with desire. God Almighty, what kind of language is this I'm writing to my proud blue-eyed queen? 
will she refuse to answer my coarse, insulting questions? I know I'm risking a good deal in writing this way, but if she loves me really, she will feel that I am mad with lust and that I must be told all. Sweetheart, answer me. Even if I learn that you two have sinned, perhaps it would bind me closer to you. In any case, I love you. I have written and said things to you that my pride would never again allow me to say to any woman. Don't be angry, dear, dear Nora. My little wildflower of the hedges. I love your body. Long for it. Dream of it. Speak to me, dear lips, that I have kissed in tears. If this filth I have written insults you, bring me to my senses again with a lash, as you have done before. God help me. I love you, Nora. And it seems that this, too, is part of my love. Forgive me. Forgive me. Jim. Joyce's biographer, Elman, said that he needed to be able to worship Nora as well as live side by side with her. He found great nobility and dignity in her, and he always told her those things, um, which I think is very interesting in the context of those letters. So we have them in Paris, and <coughs> part of the Bohemia includes the Guggenheims and their friends. And Soon, Giorgio, who's 19, enters into a relationship with Helen Fleischmann Castor, a married woman of 37. A lot of these, um, so Helen's husband has been sleeping with Peggy Guggenheim, who has been sleeping with whoever else. Um, they were very much in the sort of, that kind of milieu of everybody was with everybody. And Giorgio and Lucia then entered into that, much to Joyce and Nora's disgust. When he started the relationship with Helen, they were incensed and they wouldn't let Helen into their apartment and they wouldn't acknowledge the relationship until Nora was diagnosed with uterine cancer and they needed somebody to mind Lucia and Helen offered to take Lucia into her flat where she was now separated from her husband and Giorgio was staying a lot. Giorgio would go missing and they wouldn't really say, where were you? They knew, but they didn't want to know. So they accepted Helen's help with Lucia while Nora was in hospital. Jim stayed in hospital with Nora. This was a thing that happened. Jim suffered terribly with his eyes and every time he had an operation. And again, Kevin Birmingham's book does a brilliant job of describing those horrendous eye operations he suffered. And to think that he wrote all the way through that is amazing. Um, uh, so they accept their help and they eventually... <laughs> By the time Nora gets out of hospital and Helen has her flat cleaned and tidy and with flowers and stuff for her, they decide they have to accept Helen into their lives, even though they disapprove still. Helen manages to get her divorce and she and Giorgio decide they're going to marry. And it's at that point that Jim confesses to Giorgio and Lucia that actually myself and your mother are not married, despite what I told Time magazine. <laughs> <laughs> or who, 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 the who's who, who's who had it that they had married. He had told them that. So Helen doesn't like this at all. Helen is a wealthy, she's from a wealthy family. Uh, her father was a cutler and made a lot of money in the States. She's American. So she says to Giorgio, your parents, before we can get married, you need to be unillegitimized as such. I need you to be a legitimate son of James Joyce. There's a rumour that Helen was after Joyce and when she couldn't have Joyce, she decided to have the son. That's one of the uh, things said about her. I don't know if that's true. Maybe I shouldn't be repeating such things. But anyway, it is said. Um, so uh, Joyce has to tell Nora we have to get married. And they know that there's a danger that it will be found out that they were never married. And, you know, and of course, the paparazzi turned up outside the registry office in London where they got married and they're picture was on the front of the newspaper because Joyce is famous um, and it's very shaming for them you know they don't like it they're very annoyed 
but they end they marry Giorgio and Helen marry and um Lucia is still at this point in and out of asylums and she sees Carl Jung who she actually speaks to she didn't speak to a lot of her other doctors she would maintain a sort of a a silence with them but her diagnosis is sort of so they said hebephrenic schizophrenic in one place in another place they thought it might be hormonal issues whatever it was her behavior could be very incongruous at one point she's engaged to a russian guy alex i think it's Pozinovsky. i can't remember exactly how you pronounce his surname um, but the engagement doesn't last. She has an insane crush on Samuel Beckett, who helps her father with his secretarial work, you know, editing and letters and stuff like that. Uh, Samuel Beckett, while he likes Lucia well enough as a friend, he does not want to be in a relationship with her. And she's very let down by this. She's very upset by it. And so for a while, Beckett is banned from the apartment because Lucia is upset. But then Joyce relents and invites Beckett to his birthday party because he likes the young man. And that's the night Lucia ends up incarcerated for the first time. She throws a chair and it hits Nora. And Giorgio, her brother, puts her in an asylum that night. So it's actually Giorgio Joyce who started the chain of um, admissions for Lucia into various asylums. But Nora somehow gets the blame. There's this very... There's a lot of downgrading of Nora by various people. Um, I think she has been resurrected hugely by the Maddox biography that came out in the 80s. And I hope my novel does the work of resurrecting her even further. So the novel is a first person voice um, and it's Nora's side of the story. I wanted to know what it felt like to be married to Joyce, what it felt like to be the mother of these children who really never had careers. So Lucia was in a dance troupe and she danced, but she gave it up very suddenly. And Giorgio was a very fine bass singer. He has a beautiful voice. And that exhibition that Paula mentioned that I curated for Molly, it's about the Joyce's love with music as a bonding element. And we have a recording of Giorgio singing the only known song by Joyce, Bid Adieu to Girlish Days. And his voice is, voice is astonishing. If you're in Dublin, this year, before the 3rd of July, the exhibition will be on until then. It's an audiovisual exhibition. Molly is a museum of experiences rather than objects, though they do have issue one of Ulysses, which is a rather beautiful thing to see. So I believe our actors are going to read one more letter. Two of the actors are involved, I think. <coughs> Dublin, December 2nd, 1909. Nora, you rogue. I hardly dare to be familiar with you, and you write me such a thing. I'm agog when you write what you will do to me if I disobey you. Don't take offence at what I write, dear. You are firstly and forever my blue rain-drenched flower. My love for you allows me to honour the everlasting beauty and tenderness mirrored in your eyes. But also it means I want to force you onto your soft belly and fuck you from behind. A hog riding his sow, rejoicing in the stench and sweat that rises from your ass, glorying in your upturned dress and girdish drawers, and in the fluster of your blushed cheeks and tangled up hair. My love allows me to cry tears of pity and regard at some small word, to tremble with love for you at the sound of some note of music. Or to lie top to tail with you, and feel you fondle and tickle my balls, or sticking your fingers up the back of me, and your hot mouth sucking off my cock while my head is lodged between your plump thighs, my hands clutching the cushions of your bum, and my tongue licking hungrily at your red cunt. I have taught you almost to be overcome by my voice, singing or whispering to your soul the passion and sorrow of life, and at the same time, have taught you to make lewd signs to me with your lips to rouse me with filthy touches and sounds and even to do in my presence that most shameful and dirty act of the body. You recall the evening you pulled up your clothes and let me lie on the floor looking up while you did it. Then, love, you could not even meet my eyes. You are mine, Nora, mine. I love you. 
All I have written above is only momentary madness. The last drop of mine has hardly been spurted up your cunt before it ends, and my love, the love of my poetry, the love of my eyes for your strange beguiling eyes, blows ever my soul like a borer of spices. My cock is still hot and hard and quivering from the last brutal thrust inside you. When a low, tender hymn sounds in sorrowful worship of you from the dark cloisters of my heart. Nora, my darling, my blue-eyed blackguard girl, my gossam, be my harlot, be my mistress, my frigging mistress, my fucking whore. You will always be my wild flower of the hedges, my beautiful rain-drenched flower. Jim. Thanks a million. <laughs> Very upfront indeed. Um, I'll just take you quickly to their ending, really. And then if anyone wants to ask a question or make a comment, you'd be very welcome. So um, when World War Two broke out, Lucia was in an asylum and the person running the asylum thought that it would be safer to bring all of the patients to Brittany, that it would be just a safer place for them to be. And so they were moved up to Brittany. But the Joyce's had to flee to, I don't know how to pronounce this, so you'll help me, saint geron le pew de pew Anyway, somewhere in the south of France. Um, and they went there, and Giorgio's marriage has broken down at this point, but his son Stephen is with him. And this is the famous Stephen Joyce, who grows up to be a very strict protector of the Joyce estate and won't let people adapt. This would not have been allowed. This certainly would not have been allowed. Though I was still writing it when he was alive. Um, I was sad to hear of his death, but I do know he would have objected hugely to my book. Um, so Joyce, Nora, Giorgio and Stephen are granted access to Switzerland again. They're allowed into Switzerland to sit out the war but poor Lucia is left behind in France. And they, the German, they promise that they will let her out and then at the last minute they renege on that promise and she's not allowed to come. So they're separated and they're very, very anxious. Joyce is particularly anxious. He has believed all along, as I said, that she's not unwell. She's, she, we merely need to find the right doctor that will save her. She has seen 20 doctors at this point. So... They're not long in Switzerland when Joyce has been drinking on an empty stomach. He doesn't like to eat, but he's been drinking perno and not really eating anything. And his stomach is in a very bad way. And in early January of 1941, he collapses with terrible stomach pains and is brought to the hospital in Switzerland. And sadly, on the 13th of January, they're only there a couple of months, he dies. In fact, I think they're just there weeks. And... It's devastating for Nora and Giorgio and Stephen, who's very close to his grandparents. And they try to get his body repatriated to Ireland to be buried. And the Irish government says no, because they don't want anything to do with this writer of obscene works. Um, they're not pro-Joyce at all in Ireland. It doesn't suit the image of Ireland to have this man representing the country, even though his work is very accurate <laughs> when it comes to describing the Irish psyche and the Irish personality. Um, but the obscene stuff in Ulysses has really, you know, made him a figure of hate for a lot of people. So the government refused to repatriate Joyce's remains and Nora is furious and this ends her with Ireland. So they bury him in Fluntern in Zurich. And she spends a lot of the next 10 years until her own death in Zurich, because she stays there, going up to the grave when she can. Uh, she's riddled with arthritis. Lucia is still in France. Um, I don't think she ever saw Lucia again after that point. Uh, Giorgio did go to see Lucia on occasion. Not much. I often wonder about Giorgio's true feelings about Lucia. It cost a lot of money to keep Lucia in the asylum. 
Joyce's estate was all tied up because of the war. Harriet Weaver is sending them bits of her own money just to keep them able to pay for a pension and to eat, basically. So they're really in dire straits. And then in 1950, no, 49, I think, the couple of years before Nora died, they have a huge auction of Joyce's stuff. So the family portraits, um, manuscripts, all sorts of stuff. And a lot of it is bought by American collectors to put in American universities. And that's why a lot of the Joyce, a lot of the Joyce material is actually in Buffalo in New York and also in Cornell. And then a lot of the photographs are scattered. Um, Harriet Weaver's stuff ended up in the British Library. She wanted to give it to Ireland and Nora said no <laughs> because of the way Joyce had been treated by Ireland. So uh, there's stuff in the British Library which I have found very hard to access actually because um, I don't know, they're very slow at getting back to you from the British Library. I was looking for stuff to use for my exhibition in Mali and there's one photograph of Nora that she had done when she was older for Giorgio. He wanted a picture of his mother and she has silver hair in it, like in a Marcel wave. She looks, I call it the silver fox photo, but uh, I couldn't get permission to use it um, because the library are so poor at communicating. But the American libraries are extremely generous and let us use everything for free, actually. So it was fantastic. Um, but as well, a lot of these archives are digitized. So you can look at all these beautiful family photographs that Lucia took. She liked to take photographs, you know, very uh, casual and nice pictures of Joyce on their family holidays in Belgium, you know, sitting like this, looking like any fed up daddy at a picnic, you know. So these are beautiful insights into them as a family. And I think when you write a book like this, you have to get as wide a picture as you can. And so I read testimonies from their friends as well as the official biographies. Um, and I did use the photographs a lot to give me. I know you can't really tell anything about a person from a photograph, but, you know, for their clothing and their style, because they both had he had quite eccentric taste in clothes. He wore a dicky bow during the day, which wasn't right at the time. <laughs> um, he liked to wear plimsolls because they were comfortable. You know, he was an unusual dresser. He had a waistcoat embroidered with dogs belonging to his father that he used to wear, which is now in the Martello Tower Museum in Sandy Cove in Dublin. Um, but she dressed very finely and they had accounts in milliners. So Harriet Weaver, with her beautiful gifting of 1.5 million, <laughs> was actually paying for fancy hats and patent leather shoes and what have you and, you know, lovely clothes for the family. They were an unusual pair. They were a very loving pair and I suppose we shouldn't judge what happened to their children. You know, I think there's a lot of blame against Nora and Jim about the way the children ended up because Giorgio essentially turned into Joyce, except that he didn't write books. He became a drinker. Having disdained drinking as a young man, he became an alcoholic and he did not have a career. He did sing on occasion, but he, his nerves were very bad when it came to um, preparing for performances. And so he preferred not to perform, essentially. So I tell you, writing the second half of the book was no picnic. It was quite hard going and quite sad. But all of it, I have to say, the research um, and the writing of the book was incredibly enjoyable. And I'm happy that Nora is getting her day in the sun and a little bit of a renaissance through my novel. So thank you very much to the actors and thank you for listening to my... It's wonderful. Thank you very much, Nula. Would anyone have any questions? Yeah. I'll just bring this over to you. Two questions, um, and I hope they're not stupid. <laughs> First of all, was it easy to, or has it been easy to get access to the letters and general information and background? Or I know you mentioned the American universities were really open to that, but has it been a lot of hard work getting the sort of information you need to create the book? The Sorry, and the second yeah. question was the relationship between Nora and Luciana. And when Luciana was away, um, in Brittany, I think you said she was. Um, did she try to see her or was it just a fait accompli in terms of she was there and that was it? I suppose in terms of the 
material, any aspect of Joyce you can think of, somebody has written either a paper or a book about it. So everything from the food he ate to the music they loved to... Academics are extraordinary. They, You know, Joyce did say that Ulysses would keep the academics busy for a hundred years, or was it Finnegan's? I can't remember which one. But anyway, his work. And it's so true. There's a lot written about Joyce. So there's no end of stuff that you can access. The official biographies... The Elman biography is excellent and the Maddox biography of Nora is also excellent. You know, they're both written really in a way that is so readable and so chock full of information, though we know now that stuff has emerged since that adds to the picture. Also, Elman did a book of letters, which includes the erotic letters. Well, the second edition does. The first one, he was trying to suppress them. Well, the estate was trying to suppress them and then he published them and Stephen was not happy. But... There's so much available that I didn't even have to go to archives to read the original letters because they're published. So that was, for me, that saves a lot of time in terms of not having to travel. Like I live in Galway. Like to get to the States, it costs money and time. So the stuff is at your fingertips in that sense. And also a lot of their friends like Pork and Mary Collum and Arthur Power and all of these people wrote fantastic testimonies about being friends with Joyce. Um... Sylvia Beach as well and um, Paula and the library have a beautiful edition of the Sylvia Beach book, which was a very limited edition book. So you're very lucky to have access to that here. I'm quite jealous. Um, So there's just so much out there about that, that it wasn't difficult to do that. For me as a dub in Galway, I've been living in Galway for 25 years, but I'm from Dublin. So Joyce's language is not a problem to me, but Nora's is a little trickier. I'm not a native Galway person. And so I had to invent a voice for her. But I did that using her own letters that we have, the ones that are extant um, and the vocabulary of my Galway friends, essentially. Your second question was about Nora's relationship with Lucia. People have been very critical of it because they're judging her by, I guess, what they think they might do themselves. Nora was very cut off by the war uh, when she was in, when Lucia was still in France and she was in Zurich. Uh, She was very poor. They had very little money. She was also crippled with arthritis. So she spent months on end in hospital just trying to unbend her limbs, essentially. Um, And people don't seem to take that into account when they give out about her not visiting Lucia. Um, She was also told to stay away. There was a doctor that said, you excite her, just stay away. But so did Jim and Giorgio. She tried to strangle Jim and Giorgio when they visited. So she was really, she was often in the straitjacket and she was often lighting fires in the asylums and stuff. So she would have to be restrained. Drugs wise, God knows what she was on, you know mental health medicine at the time was fairly clunky. I mean, it's still only trying to get there now, you know, so their solution to it was to lock people away. I just heard a statistic the other day that Ireland locked people away more than any other country. So it was in the tradition, you know, but um, it's kind of frightening that instead of actually trying to help people and rehabilitate, rehabilitate them, they, Yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, sad though. It is very sad and we don't know everything and Stephen did destroy a lot of Lucia's letters. Yeah, he destroyed postcards and things that she and Beckett exchanged um, because he said they're nothing to do with Joyce so, you know, they're just personal things and he destroyed, destroyed a lot of her letters in general. He says that there was nothing in them about her father but who knows what was in them. We will never know. And then, like, we have to balance it. Should we know about these letters that the actors so beautifully read? Like, I kind of feel no. (laughs) And yet when you're writing a novel like this and these letters are in existence, you cannot possibly ignore them. I would have been, my reviews for this would have been very poor if I had ignored the sensual relationship that we know the Joyce's had uh, because the letters were published. Yeah. Thanks. I just uh, just a little question about the letters because you know when I got well, you know when I heard about you coming and so it was a lovely lovely talk and wonderful readings by the three actors. Thank you. Um, of course, I went on the internet and of course the la- la- letters are plastered all over the internet. So you know and 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 
having listened to, maybe it was because you read so beautifully, I thought, oh, they're rather mild because they didn't come across like that when, <laughs> when, when I read them. So, and, and of course, that's four out of, I don't know, there are at least eight or ten that I saw on the internet. So my question is this about, you know, those letters. Um, I did see somewhere where there are absolutely no crossings out. So we know that he's alone, lonely, uh, worried that maybe she's had a relationship with somebody. But we particularly must always remember that he is in the, he is in, in the process of making himself the greatest, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century and able to say professors will be talking about me for centuries. So the fact, there is a thing that the letters are not, there's nothing crossed out apparently in these letters and that's why it's always interesting to know. You know, on the internet you think, oh, oh who has doctored them? Because I was listening to you, that's a question I was just wondering, are, were some paragraphs removed from some of those letters? Is it the unexpert, you know, unadulterated uh, version, uh, not expurgated, you know, th th because one always has to wonder about information now because anybody can put anything on the internet and, you know, it says James Joyce uh, PDF letters and then you get into this. So my question then is, uh, I presume that those who have done all the research on Joyce have actually done the paper trail so that knowing that these letters, there's no crossings out like, you know, in, when all of us used to write letters and particularly in the state of mind that he was in and the state of excitation he was in, that it's rather surprising that they're, that they're all in perfect, there is, you know, the writing is perfect. So, so I would love to know, have we got, you know, the airmail letter with the address of Nora in Trieste with that, with the stamp to show that so on the 9th of October, when this is, you know, because after all, it's only a hundred years ago, so we're not talking about way, way back. So has that been done? Because, you know, when you know that she doesn't have, when, when her letters are not there at all, um, so did he, did he um, were they actually sent? And even if they were sent, how is it so that for so long, for 30 years before he died, that, you know, where were they kept? You know, it's, I'd love to know all of that. And that how come it was his sister-in-law, so it was Stanny's wife, Stanny's wife, who actually sold them to a university, of course, after Nora died. Um, so basically, I've just, I, I would like to know about the paper trail. For yeah. the, but so they are know. genuine. Yeah. He may have made a fair copy to send. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up with Stanny's widow because basically Stanny was a great archi archivist. He kept everything. So even when he moved to Trieste in 1905 or whatever it was, he brought with him Jim's letters that he had written to Stanny. St letters he'd written to his Aunt Jo, all sorts of stuff, letters he'd written to his mother from Paris. He brought them with him because he was aware his brother was a genius and might go far. So Stanny, when they left Trieste, Joyce and Nora left behind all sorts of stuff. And one thing was a valise with letters in it. And Joyce asked Stanny to give it back and Stanny wouldn't. Ah, okay. okay. So it ended up then with Nellie, Stanny's wife, um, and Nelly got to sell it. She actually so Stanny, in a sense, got his revenge on Jim sponging off him for, for years by okay. his wife ending up getting money from the estate, in the sense that she sold stuff against Stephen Joyce's wishes, by the way. Um, but she ended up being able to educate her son, also called James Joyce. So even though Stanny and Jim's relationship was tricky, he called his son James. Uh, weirdly, he also dialed on Bloomsday, the 16th of June, Stanny. Um, and Nellie ended up being able to buy a house for herself in the UK and educate her son with the money. She actually ended up with more money than Nora ever got out of the estate. Mm -hmm. So it was, yes, that because obviously at this stage, it's the 60s. Interest in Joyce has grown. He's suddenly being taught in the universities. He hadn't been before that. Uh, the Joyce industry is starting to get into gear and anything that comes up is of interest. Um, so Nelly actually did OK. Nelly was a lot younger than Stanny. She was 18 to his 40 when they married. So she outlived him a long time and benefited from the estate. 
Um, yeah, it's a strange one though, isn't it? But the letters are there and they're they're guaranteed. <laughs> Oh, he would have, because he was absolutely furious and upset by their publication. Who wants to see their granny being called Darling Little F-Bird and all of what we heard? Like, shocking. I did a book about Emily Dickinson called Miss Emily, and for the research for that, I read the letters between her brother Austin and his mistress Mabel, a very open affair that he had, still married to Sue. And their letters are bonkers. I mean, they're so scheming and plotty and sexual. And I remember reading them thinking, nobody should be reading these. These are just, no, <laughs> you know, they're crackers. And then obviously Joyce's letters are quite out there as well. But I, these things enter the public domain. And when you are, I didn't include, my Emily book, I didn't include that. It wasn't part of what I wanted to do, but I, I felt the need to read the book to discover more about Austin, actually, who was quite a, an eccentric character. Um, and I felt at the time I shouldn't be privy to this at all, and I felt the same about these, but any time I mentioned this project to people that this was my new project because I was so excited, they'd go, oh, you'll have the dirty letters. You know, <laughs> It's like, yes, okay, I suppose I will, you know. <laughs> and uh, you do have to. But I do understand Stephen Joyce's anger and upset. I understand it completely because the idea of private letters of mine or anyone belonging to me being published is upsetting, you know, genu like genuinely, isn't it? Yeah. No. So he was the last direct descendant of Joyce and Nora, and he died in January 2020, sadly, yeah. Any more questions? I'm conscious of the time, and now we're in 20 minutes almost, and, and Nula, you've been on the uh, the trail. 29 events Nula has done in April as part of the One Dublin, One Book on a different subject every event. So uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you for such an entertaining and insightful talk and, and just so beautifully presented. And thank you to all the thank actors Paul. and, uh, as I said, to Virginia, who is uh, the artistic director of it all. So. Uh, we can continue the chat uh, inside yeah. with some drinks if you'd like to join us. Thanks again. Thank Nula. you so much, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>